thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you for that, uh, for the context, Zach and Tianchi and Griffin, uh, a wonderful overview of, of how we've been able to do this. You know, it is safe to say that uh, all of us have spent uh, so much time together that we've all learned about each other's lives. And uh, while working together on this project. Uh, and so I have the privilege of uh, being a representative for a very large group of people that have worked tirelessly over the last year and a half uh, to uh, bring together some of the results of 4 c And so as a um, surgeon and intensivist and uh, one of the members of the 4 c consortium, um, I uh, wanted to give a quick overview of some of the results that have come out of our work. I, I plan to actually cut out a segment of some of the, what I'm, what I'm gonna talk about simply to uh, help move things along. But I wanted to kind of give just an overview again of kind of where things stand, which is um, uh, we have uh, at this point uh, papers that have shown more than 350,000 patients with COVID-19 who are involved in the study across 342 hospitals in eight countries. Um, and, uh, and this continues to grow. And as Zach had mentioned, there is uh, uh, always an opportunity to continue to collaborate. And this has been very exciting to see because we have as of right now, as far as I can tell about eight published papers in some of the major journals uh, across uh, the world. We have about 13 manuscripts that are in or near submission or revision. And we have first authors uh, across four countries. And I, I don't uh, want to, I think this should be emphasized because uh, one of the things that is most impressive about our consortium is the way in which we have, I believe, enabled collaboration and for uh, graduate students and students across uh, the world to actually be involved in this uh, program and, and uh, uh, really evaluate some, some fascinating questions. And so there are three kind of areas that I want to quickly touch on. I, I suspect that given kind of the time limitations, I, I may only get through the first two, but some of the work that we've done has really done uh, an amazing job at evaluating granular phenotyping, uh, uh, doing hypothesis evaluation, and then uh, all these things overlap, but there's really an important element to evaluating our international perspectives. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about granular phenotyping. So as Zach mentioned, uh, within the first four weeks, we generated a paper looking at the clinical course of patients with COVID-19 across 96 hospitals in five countries. And, the, and one example of this was uh, the result, as you can see from 4.11 of 2020, this is the result looking at uh, the creatinine, which is a marker of renal function for these patients. And what this initial evaluation allowed us to do is at least notice that there was something that was different between the ways in which countries were uh, looking and managing these patients. And so you can see here that the trajectory across these countries are driven by a number of different factors from the characteristics of the patients to the, to the disease course of the patients over time. And this led us to, as Zach mentioned, uh, even within the first four weeks to really uh, begin to uh, evaluate that this wasn't just one disease, but it was a disease of systemic inflammation. It was a disease of coagulopathy. It was a disease of liver dysfunction and, and a dysregulated immune response. And that kind of uh, understanding uh, really has driven a lot of the work that we've done moving forward. And so, uh, when we started to think about this, we started to say there must be at least two different groups. There are the groups that are coming to the hospital and there are groups that are getting really, really sick and are the severe types of COVID that has gotten so much attention. And so from this, we, we worked together and we, we wrote a paper where we used a set of codes to actually derive a COVID-19 severity uh, metric um, and this was using what, at the, what was a very novel uh, evaluation, which was an or logic of you looking, not necessarily at values of things, but the presence of certain severe medications, severe diagnosis, severe laboratories were indicative of the kinds of disease that the patient was undergoing. And this would be, this brought together about a hundred codes. And when we did the validation, we looked at ICU admission at, as an outcome to collaborate uh, or correlate our, our results. 
And what we showed was across different countries that we have that we could generate pretty good sensitivity and specificity for this type of metric, this phenotype. And so from that, a number of papers have kind of cascaded out from that. This was a paper that came after that where we looked at the trajectories and the ability to predict severe COVID-19 um, using this metric. There, this was a study with 342 hospitals, 36,000 patients. And what we could see is that there were clear differences across these different patient populations in a different countries. But we could also see that when we built prediction models that were based on data from different countries, we could the transportability that Tianxi was referring to could be evaluated in a way that other groups had, had not been able to do previously. And this is very important in terms of the broad scale analysis of using these types of models that are trained in one country to be able to provide insights into another. But what we were able to show is even using individual and multi lab results, we could do predictive models that were similar to each other. We then uh, looked at not only the, the severe characteristics um, at one point in time, but then we started to realize as time went on that there were different phases of the, of the and different waves of the pandemic. And so this paper looked at 79,000 patients, and you can see that as our consortium grew and as the number of patients involved in this disease process increased, our numbers increased. But what we were able to show is that there was a what we described a first wave and a second wave from January to August, and then from August to February of 2021, we were able to look at differences across countries and see very clearly that in different countries, the, 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 the first wave and the second wave was different. But that overall, what we could appreciate was that there was um, a, a overall change and reduction in, in the number of patients who were developing severe COVID-19 in the second wave based on our metrics when comparing by different countries between the first and second wave. And what this was really a reflection of was it appeared to be that there were uh, better management of patients as, as one possibility that led to the, the, a fewer number of the most severe types of COVID-19 patients. And from that kind of work, we, we move forward even now into thinking about post-acute uh, COVID and this long COVID that people have been thinking about. And so what we did as a consortium is we, we, we built some really just fascinating tools to think through how we could actually build cohorts from these different patients. And by use, we looked at multiple different forms of cohorts in order to evaluate um, whether uh, evaluating PASC in a certain way would, might give us more insight than others. And so this is, this is the overall structure of how uh, we collected the data where you can see we use different types of metrics in order to identify uh, a, a group across time and across their uh, healthcare journey. And what hey, is really cool. interesting, yes, yes. And what was really interesting about this work was the fact that uh, what you can see here is very clearly that there were um, uh, absolute differences in trends over time. So as you go through uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, different uh, quarters in the last year and a half, you can see that even looking at different characteristics in the, uh, the post-acute phase, there are different aspects of the disease process among patients who are thought to have post-acute sequelae that, are, that become more or less prominent over time. And some of this is coding, but also some of this is, is the changing face of our understanding of what the disease is. I'm going to just mention one last uh, quick thing about uh, uh, our actually our international um, uh, perspectives, just to give you a sense of exactly the kind of work that we've been able to do uh, from this um, analysis. And uh, a paper that we recently worked with a group from uh, Bertrand Moal, uh, who I believe will be speaking today, did an excellent evaluation of looking at his hospital system in France and evaluating because of the large number of patients that he was seeing who were developing severe respiratory disease and ending up in the ICU. He wanted to look at this rather rare group uh, of, of patients 
And by aggregating the data across the consortium, he was able to bear, uh, get, get a cohort that was sufficiently uh, 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 large. And what he did is he broke the, the patients down into certain groups, looking at this group that had severe respiratory disease, ARDS, who were in this young cohort, so young ARDS, and was then able to evaluate their, their outcomes and their characteristics. And, and the thing that is really fascinating, I think, to take away from this uh, paper, um, as an example of kind of the work that we're, that we're able to enable, is that across uh, three separate sites, as uh, across these uh, multiple countries, uh, or five sites, excuse me, across multiple countries, he was able to evaluate the characteristics of this group, he was able to see that, that these patients who have ARDS and are young are, uh, have a, a set of characteristics that puts them at significant risk, in particular things like diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes in particular, uh, and congestive heart failure. And these are just indications of the characteristics of what differentiates one group from another across these countries. So the takeaway from, from this work, I think is, is multiple, but the things that, is, that are really exciting to me is by uh, doing international comparisons across EHRs and across time, we're able to highlight differences in patient demographics and hospital care. And from that, we've been able to work together as a consortium to start to drive insights about the changing patterns of COVID-19 and uh, the diseases that come after COVID-19 uh, that have captured so much of the attention uh, of uh, the media and, and the medical world. So thank you very much for that. And uh, um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present some of these findings.